uh, Community Matters on Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. It's the five o'clock block on a given Monday with Manny Menendez. And we're taking a new look about business in China. You know, we've heard so much um, negativity about China. It's not only political, it's geopolitical. And we have, um, you know, the, the sort of the public uh, opinion about uh, China, you know, being uh, being hard on the Uyghurs, um, being hard on surveillance and uh, oppression, being being hard on, on its citizens. Um, on the other hand, uh, they are very effective, and Xi Jinping is an, an effective leader in, in getting business done. The question is, uh, over the past 20 years, whether um, the American businessman, such as Manny Menendez, um, has done better or worse, and what his prospects are now going forward in China, in, in, a, in a country that's effective, um, that's prosperous, even in these difficult times, but that suppresses people and suppresses uh, human rights. So many, you know, do these negative things affect you in your perception, your work, your business in China? Well, I think they're, I think they're difficult questions that you've posed. Um, and I think some of it is politically motivated because um, I don't see that reality of what you're talking about actually on the ground in China. Uh, generally, uh, in the, all over the country, people are uh, happy, they're their economy has grown. Uh, if you looked at uh, 1980, you know, the average per capita, you know, the, the average daily income was 53 cents a day, uh, you know, less than 100 bucks a year per capita. Now it's average for over 1.4 billion people. The average is now um, over 10,000 US dollars. I mean, the country has grown. Uh, all countries are not perfect, as we know. Uh, but I think overall, people's lives have improved. 500 million people have come out of absolute poverty, which is amazing uh, in China. They, they've done a good job in a lot of areas, especially with the economy. I don't uh, get involved in the politics. I do focus on the business, and the business environment has been um, fantastic. Uh, during COVID, uh, the only major economy that grew in the world was China at about 2.3% GDP growth in 2020. In 2021, that they just finished up, the GDP growth of China was 8.3%. Uh, so China, as you know, now is the number two economy in the world behind the United States. Uh, but it's a rich country, and I've said this before on your show, Jay, it's a rich country and a poor country at the same time. There's a lot of re regions in China that haven't developed yet. Uh, 1.4 billion people is a lot of people, about 22% of the world's population. But those areas in the major cities have done very, very well, and they stay on track uh, with the economy. But there are issues. Yes, there's, there's issues, uh, geopolitical issues, not just in China, but as you know, we're, we'll, our show will be interrupted when they, uh, uh, Putin starts knocking on the door uh, and enters Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine so... Um, well, we, we certainly have uh, global issues. Matter of fact, Think Tech is doing a program on April 1st about global issues in six continents with six um, simultaneous live speakers. Uh, and, and, you're, and, you're not, and you're not fooling on April 1st. You're, you're serious about that. No, this is not quite serious. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> but, you know, it, it, does, uh, it does take you to, to Xi Jinping's uh, common rhetoric to the effect that um, that you know he has achieved democracy in China. People vote in China, representative government in China. People have rights in China, maybe not in the same way they, we see those rights. Um, and in fact, and this is my question to you, in fact, as far as he's concerned, the, the, the system, if you will, in China, uh, the democracy such as it is in China is better, more effective and more caring than the system in the US. I'm sure that could be debated uh, on this side of the pond, but I can say just generally speaking, the people in China, and I talk to not just leaders and, and government leaders, but the actual people on the ground, they feel that their lives have improved and the, the system has not clamped down on them in any uh, onerous way. I mean, I think that uh, there's certain areas that, that there's issues that have come up uh, we don't know the whole story, you know, uh, but they, they're sensitive issues. And I think that China, you know, ha has 
to address them. And I think they're trying to do that in a responsible way. But at the same time, uh, the boss, uh, we call him Xi Dada, not Xi Jinping, but everyone's known uh, in China, we call him Xi Dada. Mm. He's uh, uh, leading the country. Uh, he's strong. He's certainly a strong leader, Jay. There's no doubt about that. And uh, I think that they're going now in March, as we speak, uh, uh, they'll go into what's called the double, double sessions of the government. Uh, and we'll see if he gets his... Uh, his third term, which is a big thing, because that's not. Oh, it's a big before. thing. But is there any question in your mind? There's no, no question in my mind. No, he's not at have all. His third term, yeah. No, just but remember uh, um, that there have been leaders, even in the U.S. FDR. He was in for how many terms? Four terms, maybe five. Uh, and in, until they changed it. And yeah, until they, until they changed it exactly. But um, we'll we'll see. I mean, the economy is doing well. There are certain issues, uh, you know, maritime issues, Taiwan issues, uh, you know, Xinjiang issues. I mean, every, every country has its hot list. Uh, we have a few here in the US and certainly other parts of the world, but uh, I, I think they're handling things methodically and, and, and trying not to disrupt uh, the country as they deal with, uh, with, with certain issues. I mean, it's, they're complicated. And, and quite frankly, I don't think anyone knows both all sides of the story, you know, because we have limited limited information. Um, and when people get uh, questioned quite hard on, you know, they said it's uh, in, in Xinjiang genocide. I mean, the Chinese, there's no Chinese I know of that will agree uh, to that at all. But I've never seen any data that supports that. Now, I don't have access to the data that maybe. Uh, our top government officials do, but I, I just don't see that. And I've had people recently go to that area um, and they said things seem to be normal, but I, I, I just don't know. And I stay away from those things, by the way, Jay, because I just don't well, know. I was going to ask you about that. that. That is the smart money to stay away from it. And, and uh, all of the people that I know, including, you know, Chinese people from Hawaii and for that matter, Chinese people from China, are uh, very careful, very circumspect circumspect about making any political statement at all, or any, for that matter, negative statement about what's going on in China. And I expect that if you want to do business in China, all the more important that you you be circumspect too. It's, it's, it's just good business, right? It's good business, but I, I don't see it, you know, so I, I you know, facts do matter. Um, uh, one of the famous quotes from Deng Xiaoping, the supreme leader in the 1980s in China, and really is the architect of the open door policy. He always said, uh, and, and I had the privilege of meeting him on several occasions, but he, he always said, seek the truth from the facts. And I so I, I'd like to see more facts on these sensitive issues, but on, on where, where I focus and the people that I talk to, I just don't feel that and I, I don't see it on, on the ground. So, um, so maybe there's- Okay, well, let me, last, last time I looked, Manny, and I, I have, seen you over the years. I've seen you at the Plaza Club for the Venture Capital Association, yes. seen you here on Think Tech, you know, I'm sort of watching your trajectory over, I don't want to say a lifetime, but a long time anyway. It's a long and, time. <clears throat> long time. And, um, you know, I, I admire you for, um, you know, for being there and doing business there. I mean, for example, I, I've noticed over the years that you are indeed an American Howley. I've noticed that. Um, and uh, hard not to notice that. <laughs> <laughs> and you go to China and you manage and, and you, you know, you can do business. You can come back. It's almost as if uh, it's, it's, it's uh, you're impervious to the, whatever the problems are. And I, I guess um, I, I want to know how that's possible, because even if you take, you know, the cautious route, even if you are careful, you know, not not to not to get into anything contentious. The fact is there are people in China that don't particularly like Americans and they don't like American businessmen. Do you ever feel that? No, I don't. I haven't, I, you know, and, and I'm, I don't think I'm a, a rare case. I think generally, if you go back to Confucius thinking, one of the things that, uh, uh, that Confucius said, when people come from afar, you should be happy and welcome them. And I have felt that Confucius thinking anywhere I went in China, the, the very open, very welcoming society. 
and uh, I I have not felt I, I was not welcomed, you know. So, and I don't think that's unusual for foreigners. I don't think it's unusual for Americans. I I think that there's a lot of uh, during the last uh, administration here in the states. I think that um, you know there was a lot of things that went sideways, a lot of negative uh, trade wars and things that I some some. I think were avoidable and not necessary, and really hurt uh, the U.S. side more than the Chinese side in terms of uh, increased prices, supply chain issues, so forth. But but I think working, uh, I have a, a saying uh, that if you keep working with people and keep dialoguing with them, uh, that's the best way to develop guanxi or friendships. And as you mentioned. I mean, I've been in China now. It's going on. I don't want to admit it, but it's going on uh, four decades, uh, and I've been there since the opening and right through to today. Um, and I think that experience does matter. You have to know what you're doing. A lot of people go to China unprepared, and, and you really just ha really have to have the experience of doing the business there because there there are things. The end goal is always the same. Everybody wants to be successful, make money. Have a sustainable business, but how you get there, there's a whole different roadmap, if you will, when you're in China. There's there's some different uh, ways of doing things. Not negative. It's just a Chinese way versus a U.S. way is a lot different. We like to get things to the quickly to the end goal very fast. You don't need to know anyone. You can just sign a contract to move ahead. In the states uh, and in China, relationships and building relationships first. Really does matter a lot if you want to uh, get to the finish line. I have a saying: go slow to finish first. So go slow in the beginning. Make sure that you develop the relationships and the friendships and uh, the trust. Uh, in Chinese, it's guan qi, and then so you can get to the finish line first. We kind of rush in the beginning, and then and then issues develop after after we move forward. I I've been to China three times. Uh, all in the aught years, um, and um, I I saw at least in the first and second trip, probably the third trip too, an opening, uh, like you say, a Deng Xiaoping opening, where um, people in China wanted to have you there, they wanted to do business with you, they were eager, um, um, and um, you could make a deal, and everybody was looking to make a deal all the times in every you know interaction that I had. But I'd say this, that it seems to me that uh, over the past 10 years, maybe more, um, there has been a dynamic. And my question to you is, you've been there, you've followed this for decades. That is really something. You should, you should write a, a, um, a book. You should write a book, Manny. If you haven't already, you should write a book like, uh, like uh, Jerome Cohn, you know, My Life in China. Right? So, so, so Jerry, Jerry Cohn is my pal. I mean, he's 91 now. And uh... He he was a, a lawyer for some of my deals at Paul Paul Weiss up in up in New York City. Mm -hmm. I call him Bowtie Jerry. Always wore a bow tie. <laughs> yeah, but he's he's a he was one of the first. He was one of the first attorneys in, in China. Great guy, great man. He's been on our show a couple of times. Yeah. No, no, he's he's Jerry. He's a great guy, great but guy. he's mighty mighty concerned about what happened, what is happening in Hong Kong. By the no, way. He, he, if you he read is. his newsletter, I know. Yes. So the question is, uh, over the past decade, or maybe a little more than that, there's, there's always a dynamic. You know, this, as you said, there's a dynamic in the world. There's a dynamic in the US, for sure. Um, not necessarily a good one. And there's a dynamic in Europe. We see that every day, probably every minute. And there's changes happening. And so what are the changes been as far as the business community, business opportunities of a businessman like you in China, I mean, it, nothing ever stays the same. The only thing that's constant is change. And I'm just wondering what the change has been for you. Is it easier to do business now? Is it harder? What do you have to watch out for now that you didn't have to watch out for before? Well, in, in, in the beginning, that's a great question, uh, Jay. I mean, in the beginning, uh, kind of both sides didn't know what we were doing with new laws, joint venture laws like equity joint ventures or technology transfers. Everybody kind of was learning. But one thing stayed the same. If you built the relationships and things didn't go right, 
if you made a solid foundation, you could, you could move uh, easily uh, to solutions. I think the big difference is in the early days, it would, took longer to get things done, but once you got them done, uh, they were solid and, and uh, were, there, there was not that, not that much competition in the market. Now, I think it's easier to get paperwork done. You know, it's like set, setting up an LLC. You can do it quickly in China. Uh, you can set up legal stuff quickly, but uh, actually entering the market it's a it's a very different market than it was in in the 1980s. So you have to really be more surgical. And many of the people that I advise or have helped over the years, I say when you think about doing business in China, your mind will explode. But if you think about it in a different way, for example, if you have a product or service, think about a city of which the demographics fit that product or service. Because, for example. The population of Beijing, 23 million, is equal to the population of Australia. Same of Shanghai. So you can be in four or five cities that are size of major countries. The people who commute in and out of Beijing every day are about four million people. That's you know three three point something times the size of Hawaii. So when you think about business in China, you really have to think today about your product and service and your entry strategy, and be more surgical. Uh, because everyone in the world is there. And when you hear all the issues, oh, well, you know, there's this problem and that problem. I can tell you every major corporation in the world is in China doing business because they know it's a robust and growing market. So uh, I, I- What do you mean, what do you mean surgical, Manny? What's surgical, surgical mean? Surgical means instead of uh, thinking you're gonna just enter the whole country, just again, pick that product or service and pick some cities that you can enter at a very surgical, a surgical level is at a city level. <clears throat> because again, the size of these cities are massive, you know, and if you, you can do well in two cities and have a huge business. I mean, all the major luxury brands, every single luxury brand is there killing it. Every major auto company is uh, in China and there's been a shift, what I call the center of gravity has moved even where design centers of products are actually coming out of China now, where in the past, a car might have been designed in Detroit, but some of these models now are be actually being designed in China for the China market. So I, I think being surgical in your thought process and figuring out, again, who your partners are, because in China, one of, I think, the keys of success is who are your partners? Who are you working with? And if, you have, if, if you've done your homework and done the due diligence and really spent the time at building the relationships and you have a great partner and they are part of the economic equation, you make money, they make money. They lose money, you lose money. If you really are tied together that way, I think you can avoid a lot of the pitfalls in China. But you got to know what you're doing. Ex experience does matter. Well, one, one, I would make a guess and say that in the past 10 years, 15 years, um, the average uh, Chinese executive is going to be more Akamai than he was before. He's going to know more about the West. He's going to know more about the U.S. The chances are that he took a, a, a college master's Ph.D. Uh, in the U.S. or in or in um, Britain or anywhere somewhere Australia. else. Australia, yeah, usually English Australia, speaking, yeah, English speaking countries, U.K., Australia, and U.S. Over over one point, I think it's. I don't have the current data, but it's at least 1.5 million Chinese students have studied in the U.S. and 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 have gone back. So, I think that is a great uh, a great point, Jay. I mean, having the global experience, the Chinese have now, you know, the, the largest traveling tourist population in the world is China. China, about 175 million people travel outside. Of, this is pre-COVID but travel outside uh, the world. And, and I think that makes a difference. Well, how about COVID itself, you know? I mean, everybody wonders. And we do have a, a young fellow who spent a couple of years in China uh, teaching English. And he came back and he does a show with us every every couple of weeks. And I'm, I'm so impressed with that. I'm so impressed with his show. But, um, you know, he was there through through COVID and you've been there through COVID. And I would ask you the same question I would ask him. How, how did COVID affect your life? How did COVID affect the country? How did COVID affect the way you engage with others and with the government? 
Well, I, I think I think there's an interesting dynamic there. You know, when when COVID came up and the country said wear masks, everyone wore masks. I mean, it, there was no pushback because they know, and, and just generally in Asia, I, you know, I've worked a lot in Japan and Singapore, a lot of other countries. If you're sick, everyone puts a mask on anyway, if they have a cold, it's a, it's a kind of a normal habit because they don't want to spread it to somebody else. So there was uh, zero pushback in China and not because of what, you know, uh, maybe US rhetoric would be, oh, the, the communist government pushed everybody to wear masks. No, the people themselves want to protect other people and they want to keep things moving forward. I think the Chinese have not give, been given enough credit for the wonderful job they've done to contain COVID. I think they're going to have some issues going forward, but, but they have a zero COVID policy. It was difficult. I've been back three times since uh, 2020 uh, when it started, and you have to get a special visa. You have to go through quarantine. And I can tell you the quarantine part, I don't like. <laughs> I don't think anybody. But it's likes twenty-one it. days or something. It's really it's, yeah, it's onerous. Called, yeah. It's called fourteen. Now it's fourteen plus seven. In the beginning it was fourteen, but it's fourteen plus seven. And it's not just for Westerners. It's for everyone. So if you're yeah. Chinese and you travel abroad, you have to go through the same quarantine. They're serious. They're serious. And 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 usually, if, if there's an outbreak, they they target the area. They lock it down. They test everyone. I mean, there was a a, a, a case in in Qingdao. And uh, uh, they, they think that the COVID came in on some imported products. And they, within 72 hours, they tested 12 million people. I mean, they, they can deploy, uh, when, when it comes to deployment and testing and doing fast testing and tracking and tracing, China has done a marvelous job. And, and, and I think that's why they have almost very, very few cases. I, I don't think you can avoid COVID anywhere in the world, but they've really done a great job at managing it and keep, keep the economy moving. There's a balance there. We spoke for a minute before the show about the Olympics and all that. Um, but, uh, you know, with, with all of the, the threat of COVID and the and mutations in COVID, um, they nevertheless pushed through on the, the Olympics. Um, what's that about? I mean, wouldn't it have been more, more prudent if you wanted zero COVID not to have the Olympics? No, but I, I think that would be a mistake. I mean, and I think China would agree. I mean, you don't not have the Olympics if you're the host. And also it was the first time that a country had the Summer Olympics and the Winter Olympics in the same country. Uh, so that I don't think China, I don't think any country would miss that opportunity. But what they did do is they created these bubbles so that, you know, when you came in the airport, you had a certain way to go, all the athletes, they had special transportation, and, and they really tried to uh, keep everybody safe. I mean, that was the priority. It's not anything onerous. I mean, you could put any spin on it you want, but I can tell you the Chinese government leadership, it's all about keeping the people safe. You want to put any other kind of political spin on it? Uh, I've seen that before, but I mean, that's, that's their purpose. They wanted to keep everyone safe. And I think they had the largest, I don't know the final number with the largest audience of any Olympics in, in, uh, in history. I don't know what the, the actual final number. I know there was like 400 million Chinese per night watching, uh, uh, watching the Olympics, but I forget what the global audience was. Oh, sure. So um, the last couple of times that you and I spoke, Manny, we spoke about coal, about clean coal. Uh, yeah, in China, you were heavily involved in that, and I wonder if you still are, and, and whether that's been affected by uh, China's uh, announced intention to, you know, deal with climate change, to deal with fossil fuels, and and to try to go renewable. Um, they they have the technology, and they they made the statement, um, but query, how does that affect you and and clean coal? No, I think I think they they've done a great job. Again, uh, they're spending about. I want to say uh, $10, $11 billion a year on environmental technologies to clean up. Uh, the latest uh, project I'm working on is a, a U.S. technology that takes uh, nitrous oxide NOx out of combustion systems. It's a breakthrough technology, wonderful uh, company based in Tulsa. Um, but the clean coal, I think the realistic, my realistic view on coal is Countries that have coal 
it'll take a while for them to get off. It's not going to be an easy transition off a of coal like Vietnam, like uh, India. India has the largest coal, uh, coal production in the world. China, largest producer of coal, largest user of coal. But cleaning it up is a, is a start. And I can tell you in terms of renewables, China has more solar, more wind, more geothermal, more hydro install capacity than anybody in the world. I mean, they're going full bore on renewables and you'll see the big next breakthrough is gonna be in hydrogen technologies. So at the Olympics, all the buses and cars were hydrogen fuel cell, zero emissions. I mean, the byproduct of a hydrogen fuel cell is water dripping out of your tailpipe. But I mean, it's, it, they, they went all hydrogen. It was amazing at EV. So they're the largest market for EV so the, uh, will be the largest market for hydrogen uh, fuel cell technology. You'll see, you'll see that in high-speed trains and trucks and cars, but we're really, uh, uh, they're doing a fantastic job on um, pollution control. I can tell you in the past, in the wintertime, you could not see, you know, 10 years ago, 20 feet in front of you. Now, uh, uh, the blue sky days is what we call it in China. Blue sky days are many and the, not, uh, the emissions have been really curtailed because they've moved really away from coal, especially in populated areas to uh, natural gas. Uh, so th I think they're doing a really a good job on environment. They, they don't get enough credit for that. And I think that they stepped up to the place for the Paris agreements and going carbon neutral um, and carbon peak by 2030 is the goal and tw 2060 is carbon neutral. And I think they'll beat that, those dates. Well, that uh, raises another question I wanna ask you. But first, do you, do you live in the Beijing area? Because I remember that Beijing had ring roads around the city Many. and um, <laughs> there, there was a lot of, uh, a lot of um, you know, particles in the air. Uh, is that all been resolved? No, it, it's, it's not all, but it's, it's dramatically, dramatically improved. The, 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 the thing that when you have coal, I'll give you an example, very specific example. In Beijing, they have 12,000 uh, district heating boilers. They used to be all, almost all coal fired. Then China said, we got to reduce that 2.5 PM uh, particulate matter. Um, we got to get that out of the air. We got to low nitrous oxide. So within a three year period, they went from 12,000, I'm giving you round numbers, but 12,000 uh, industrial boilers burning coal, to now it's 98%, 99% natural gas. There's no coal, especially in these populated areas. Now, when you go out in the outer regions, there's still coal. I mean, in the United States, we still burn a lot of coal. I think the last time I looked, and it wasn't that recently, but the last time I looked, we're doing about a billion a billion tons of coal fired plants in the U.S. That's the usage, mm -hmm. a billion tons of coal for electrical power generation. It used to be about 50% of the electrical power in the States came from coal. In China, it's like now about 65% is coming from coal. And then uh, the balance is, is uh, oil, about 20% is oil. And then uh, the remaining is all um, uh, renewables. And there's been a big push in China also uh, to go nuclear. You know, uh, France, as you know, the whole country of France is nuclear. I think it's 90% is nuclear. Uh, and China is now uh, going to increase that mix to probably to about 5% of the total energy mix will be, uh, will be nuclear. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, positive points about nuclear, especially in a time of concern about global warming. And it's, so it's, it's renewable. <laughs> You just have to, when you build it, you can't make shortcuts. You just got to make sure that you have all the safety protocols and siting, you know, like Fukushima, you'll never see a plant uh, put on the coast and where, where earthquakes or, or um, tsunamis can have an impact on them. You know, I wanted to also ask you sort of the larger question about the economy. You know, we've heard, we, we had heard to use that expression, we had heard a lot about Belt Road. And indeed, it's a pretty dramatic statement to say that they're going to Spain. 
on the and and that not too long ago there was a piece in the newspaper about how you could get on a train in Beijing and travel all the way to Spain, not the same train, but on on rail you no, could do that. Yeah, it's it's part of the BRI uh, Belt and Road Road Initiative. Yeah. So how is that doing? Because you know we're in a time of COVID, and and there has been you know a certain effect on economies all along the route. Um, is it still going strong? Uh, is it still a high priority for the Chinese government? Well, very strong. So mobility. You're you're hitting on a key factor that has helped China grow. Two two big kind of aha moments. Well, I'll give you three. One. The largest migration in human history has taken place in China, where when we started in the 1980s, 80 percent, 85 percent of the population lived in the rural areas and 15 percent lived in the cities. And then about eight years ago, that 50 percent then went into the cities and now it's 60, 70 percent like the U.S. So there's been this huge human migration of people from the rural areas to cities. So that's number one. Number two, there's been the birth of a true middle class in China. So about 500 million people in China are in the middle class. And that's what's driving the economy today, like our economy, is domestic consumption. So domestic consumption, well, China used to be government spending and exports, government spending and exports. So that was the, the, the China of the past. Now, China moved from a world factory to, to a world market. And so when that shift occurred, is it's being driven by a, a, a affluent middle class of about 500 million people. I think we have 330 million people in the US total. China's middle class is over 500 million. Well, and our middle class is a lot less than 300. <laughs> yeah. so, so, so China's middle class is really, uh, and the third part is because of that, China's plan on uh, mobility, the high-speed train is the only thing I'll take in China when I have a choice. It's efficient, it's on time. It's, you know, the, the average like 350 kilometers an hour. Uh, I'll send you a video of that. I actually have a, a couple on my phone from recent, uh, my recent trip. Um, and it's the mobility to connect, you know, first tier cities, second tier cities, third tier cities, and also uh, the surrounding region. Yes, the, the, the plan is everywhere the Belt and Road uh, uh, goes, a uh, high speed train will go. You can get on a train in uh, Beijing and uh, go all the way uh, to uh, Shenzhen, go all the way to South China, or go all the way to the north to Heilongjiang province or go all the way to Tibet. You wanna to go to Tibet, get on the, uh, and they have a special train, by the way, that goes to Tibet because, because of the high altitude. I remember that it's was actually, in the newspapers. It's that actually was pressurized. Very interesting. It's just like an airplane. It, it's actually a pressurized <laughs> cabin. So, oh, no kidding. Yeah. You know, so, uh, no, I think mobility is, is part of uh, allowing uh, the economy to grow. Well, I know I was going to say the same thing. Mobility is more than just getting around. Oh, no, Mobility it's... is integrating the country, integrating the economy, pulling people together, uh, allowing the you know central government to do things it could not otherwise do, allowing people to um, experience uh, other places the way, and and that means business deals the way they would not otherwise have the chance. Um, so mobility is much more, and I think. You know, we, we have had a show, we will have a show about mobility in Latin America, uh, that these, these countries, uh, one of the great failings in Latin America is they don't have any infrastructure. Yeah, we should look at the, as a case of mobility is Curitiba. Look, look that up and you'll see that uh, uh, the, the governor there who came to Hawaii, uh, and I remember that's when I was uh, uh, working in the cabinet uh, with, with the mayor, Mayor Harris those days, he came, uh, Jaime uh, Lerner, I'm just going back through my database in my head, uh, and he came and he put tremendous uh, uh, mobility programs in, in uh, Curitiba. But what's interesting, I, I used to joke uh, with uh, then Mayor Harris, I said to him, if you wanna do the high-speed uh, rail, let's make a joint venture with China, and it'll, it'll, it'll be built in 18 months. You know, that was and good then, advice. And then, and then the second thing I said is, and when you cut the deal, 
when you cut the deal with any of these people who are actually, because uh, economic development was my focus. So one of the things that you, I said, I thought it was, I still think it's a great idea is instead of just having the rail companies supply you with rail cars, actually put in a area in, you know, maybe it's where we have open space in Waipahu or somewhere there's open area, put in a rail uh, maintenance and repair facility and actually build, actually assemble, actually assemble some of the rail cards, provide jobs in Hawaii where they don't send you the, because I, I do a lot of manufacturing. So a lot of things I make in different places and then I pull it together. Uh, and that's also one of my strategies on how to uh, protect IP is in China, I might make three things in three different places and then I put it together in my facility where I have uh, uh, our people working on the assembly and putting the secret sauce into the whatever I'm making. So the same thing holds true in Hawaii, you know, to provide jobs, we could have the rail company. I know they wouldn't like it. I'm not saying 100% of the rail cars, but a percentage of the rail cars you can actually assemble in, in, in Hawaii, uh, provide higher paying jobs. And at the same time as you're assembling it, you, you're understanding actually how to fix it going forward. Maintenance is so important. You Ma know, that well, uh, maintenance we, we need to have that expertise. You know? and, and I think that's a way to do it. And I think that the, it would be a little creative thinking where you, you would do that. But, you know, a part of it is to create. Uh, create that was good uh, advice on jobs. both points, Manny. And uh, boy, if they had taken that advice, we'd be in a different place on rail today. Well, we, we, sure. were, we, we were pushing at those days, the, uh, you know, the uh, high speed buses. <laughs> so to, to avoid the tremendous infrastructure costs, and we were going to create some dedicated lanes. And we thought that the solution back then was hybrid, high speed buses. And then if you have an event in town, you can redeploy the buses to the event as well. So I, it, it, there's more optionality uh, with the, the plan we had. That didn't didn't end up going anywhere, but I, I still think it was, you know, for certain key routes, if you had key lanes that you built just for high-speed hybrid uh, buses, I, I think we would have uh, saved a bunch of money and got it done a lot quicker. Well, that demonstrates something about you and about, you know, being a businessman, and that is you have to be indefatigable. <clears throat> so if somebody says no great idea but we're not going to do it you have to go on to the next idea and i know that's what you've been <laughs> doing your whole professional life yeah. uh, and my my last question to you is this is um okay again things are changing um and uh, you know indeed as china grows and grows more influential more dominant if you will in asia pacific um and maybe more arrogant too uh, its relationship with the U.S. changes depending on the administration. Um, and Trump certainly was a special case, but this could happen again with another administration. Remember, Joe Biden has not taken off the, uh, the, no. the tariffs. It's still there. Uh, and, and there are people in this country who, you know, they don't like China. They don't like Chinese, regrettably. Um, so, you know, it all changes. It will all change. And it's hard to say that the world is heading for, um, you know, a kumbaya. We're not heading for kumbaya, maybe something else, but not kumbaya. So the question is, where does that put you? Uh, you're a citizen of two countries, business-wise. Uh, <laughs> you, you know the both, and you know how to you know, leverage, <clears throat> um, deploy business ideas from one to the other. Um, arbitrage, arbitrage of ideas arbitrage of business skills and tips and tricks and what have you, um, you know, manufacturing techniques, what have you. And so uh, where does that put you? Where are you going? Are you going to spend more time in, in the U.S., in Hawaii or Seattle? Are you going to spend more time in China? Um, is this a, a resilient, uh, sustainable uh, position for you to maintain after all these 40 years? Yeah, I, I, I think it is. I, I think China... Um focus is to keep growing the economy, trying to improve people's lives. <clears throat> and um, and I, th I think in the U.S., and, and I believe this, and I, I say this uh, from a business perspective, and it's part of my motto of world peace through world trade. Uh, and I, I believe that the more you interact with people, whether that's on a cultural level, sports level, student exchanges, 
business level, the more you're talking, the more you're rubbing shoulders, <clears throat> both sides, there's more uh, dialogue, you can solve anything. I'm not going to say that they're easy solutions because there's history. You got to remember China's history. They were occupied by other force, other countries, you know, and they have a, a long history uh, that you have to look back at. And, and there's certain sensitivities because they were occupied by other countries that uh, they want to stay strong. But the other thing I always say is you got to look at the neighbors of China. Look at the neighbors of the, I always joke about this, but it's a serious joke. Look at the neighbors of the US, Canada, got to worry about the Canadians. Mexico, got to worry about Mexico. Bermuda, you got to worry about Bermuda, you know? But if you look at the neighborhood that China lives in, you have Russia, you have North Korea, you have Pakistan, you have India. Uh, and I'm not saying anything bad about those countries. I'm, that's not my point. But all those countries are nuclear. So in the China, you got to kind of sometimes walk in the other person's moccasins, as they say, uh, as uh, Mark Twain said. <laughs> so if you walk in the other guy's moccasins and Mark Twain, uh, you'll think about what China is thinking about. They're second largest economy and they got all these neighbors. Some of them have been unpredictable in history. And they're worried about that, you know. It's and and I think that you know at least the leaders that I talk to, the posture that China takes because we didn't talk about the military because I'm not certainly not going to talk about that. That's something out of my wheel well. But I'm just saying, wheelhouse. I think when you look at um, the neighbors, one of the things that the Chinese are following because it always comes up about how they built up the military. The U.S. spends about 750 billion dollars a year on military. China spends, to our knowledge, two, 200 billion. Say that they're not uh, uh, doing the accounting right, make it 300 billion, but whatever it is, their concern is they want to have a very, very robust and strong defense so that if anything happens, they can switch to offense. And I think the US posture has been the same. We want to make sure we have the best, and, and we do have the best and strongest military in the world. And I think that the point is, is that uh, the same, same is for China. You have to be, have the best at what you do in order to protect your, your national assets. So I think that's what their mindset is. Uh, and, and, and again, the leadership that I've seen and I've had the privilege of knowing in China, uh, they really want a, a country that's doing well. They wanna improve people's lives. They've never, when you think about the history of China, they haven't kind of ventured into Europe or ventured into other areas to take over real estate. They've stayed in China. They've had conflict internal in China, but they haven't expanded their footprint. Uh, it's not part of their char characteristic. Well, and, you know, but you're excluding uh, Hong Kong and Taiwan from that and Tibet and maybe Mongolia too. Uh, so in the, in the neighborhood, they have expanded their footprint. Um, but obviously beyond the neighborhood, they haven't and can't and won't, not well, for Hong, now. Hong, Hong Kong was a 99-year lease that uh, uh, yeah. was, was over and has always been part and of they, they couldn't wait. <laughs> 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 anyway, um, um, I just, I want to say, I think I learned something and I want to articulate it and see if you agree, is that, you know, like nations, uh, when you're doing a deal with a um, Chinese organization, um, you have to understand the special mindset of the Chinese. And one more step, you have to understand what the Chinese person or organization thinks of you. So you have to, you have to feel it coming back. Um, you can't, it's not a one-way street. You have to see both sides of the street. You have to see not only how you feel about him and he feels about you. It's like, um, it's like the barbershop mirror. You know what I mean? Yes. It just goes on indefinitely, uh, the sort of uh, reverberating between the two of you. Am I right about that? Yeah, I, I think you have to be like, it, it doesn't have to be just China, but I mean, it's really critical in China. Relationships do matter. I think you have to be forthright, you know, and when I hear, you know, things like, oh, they forced us to do this or forced to do that. I, I've never, I've been in situations where the deal or the transaction wasn't a good deal. And I and because the relationship was good, I just say we can't 
we can't move forward. I mean, I was never forced ever to, to make a bad decision. So you can just say it's not going to work out. I mean, that, that's that's what I think is important because sometimes I hear, oh, we were forced to do this, forced to do that. There's there's no one holding a gun to your head in China. You're there uh, uh, literally because you want to uh, maybe expand your product or service into that market. Maybe you want to do something for export. But if the deal is not right, you just don't do the deal. You know, there's no one's forcing it. So so in in answer to your question, there's no shortcut in building truthful, honest, foundational relationships and making sure you, you work through that to make sure that you have the right alignment in your, your, your thought process going forward. And I always spend time when I'm working in China talking about what happens when things don't go right. You got to spend just as it's in, in, in Chinese thinking, it's called yin and yang, you know, where there's darkness, there's light. We've heard of that. So no, yes. So yeah, that's all over the world in every culture, is it? <laughs> that's right. So, so I think you have to spend the time uh, and building that relationship in the front. That's where I said go slow to finish first. And once you know that you have the right partner, you're done to due diligence, uh, then you can proceed step by step, and you'll get to the finish line a lot faster than than most people. What I really like to do in another show with you, Manny, is have some case studies. Anonymous sure. case studies, not, not, no naming of names, just uh, the kinds of things that happen, the kinds of things that you learn in a given deal. You know, years ago, um, in the time we spent with the Venture Capital Association, there were a lot of people trying to do deals and a lot of Chinese were here. Um, sure. You know, tra- telling you how to do deals. But as it stands, let me say, it seems to me you're a survivor of this. You you can still, you're still doing it. You're still able to discuss it. You're still able to tell us, to teach us um, how to do these deals. Even now today, after all the things we've been through with China, that is really, really interesting. Well, I, so I, 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 I could give you some case examples. I mean, everything I've done there has not been perfect. I mean, there's been challenges, but the key is, you know, the, the, the famous saying, it's not how you fall down, it's how you get up. I mean, I think the key, uh, Jay, is your thought process of when things happen, not to get in the blame game, but really get into the solution game. Don't blame, you know, someone did this or someone did that. I mean, that's not going to build any relationship. Look at the issue and then figure out together with your Chinese partners how to make it better because they want to make things better. Usually, you know, someone, uh, a lot of Westerners say, oh, they did this, they did that. I hear a lot of horror stories, but really I think again, going back to building the relationship, when things happen, have the ability to pick yourself up and then look uh, together mutually uh, for uh, solutions. Because at the end of the day, the old saying, you have to have just three things, mutual understanding, that takes time. They sound simple, but mutual understanding takes time to really have mutual understanding. Then you have to have mutual benefit. Mutual benefit comes from mutual understanding. What is the benefit for, for the parties? And the third is a given in any country, but important in China, is you have to have mutual respect. And if you don't have respect for the other guy, so, that, so sometimes when there's political issues and I see these guys going at each other, they don't, they're not going to come to a solution if they don't actually have a, you can agree to disagree is what I'm saying. Yeah, very wise, very wise. Manny Menendez, our old friend, um, uh, hither and yon between the U.S. and China, really enjoyed this discussion. We'll have to do it again. Thank you, Manny. And may I say, Xie Xie and Sai Jian. Sai Jian.